three, one. Now, I, wa I wanted to start off with something that uh, it just touched me. Um, you know, I get a lot of emails, obviously, uh, too, not too many, but too many to, to answer as quickly as I should, but not too many. But I, I was sending an email on a YouTube thing that struck me about, you know, especially about the subject of reincarnation. You know, a lot of people have big trouble with that. And this was about a little girl who's six years old, and she's on YouTube, and she's playing a piano like, you know, a, a, con a master concert pianist. She's playing classical music on the piano and all this stuff. And her grandmother said she started playing when she was two. How could, how is this possible? She has played at the White House. She's given a recital at the White House, and she plays with symphony orchestras all over the country. She's this big, and in addition to that, she plays with dolls like any other kid, whatever. But she's playing this music, and then the guy said, once in a while, she plays jazz because jazz is somewhat like classical intermixing. I mean, it was... You'd think you were listening to uh, somebody who had been playing 50 years, a concert pianist. But the part that struck me is she looked in the camera and the guy said to her, well, what, you know, what kind of music do you like best? And she says, I like Mozart. And he says, well, you know, what is it, what is it you like about Mozart? And she, thought, and she looked in the camera and she says, I'm like him and he's like me. And then she turned around and went and played with her doll. And I said, Miss Mozart. I mean, where, you know, I mean, just common sense. Forget religion. I mean, just common sense. How does a two-year-old kid start playing a piano? And how does a six-year-old kid play so brilliantly classical music and then turn around and say about Mozart, I'm like him and he's like me? And the guy says to her, where's that come from? And she says, I don't know, maybe my heart. It, there is a beautiful, wonderful secret that we have been prevented from understanding. Uh, and thanks to so many today who are trying uh, to make these things available to people. I've been talking a lot recently about UFOs because of the Emerald Tablet. And, you know, I was always one that said, I'm not going to talk about UFOs. Because most people that talk about UFOs are lumped as nuts. I didn't talk about UFOs, but I was lumped as nuts anyhow. <laughs> but I said, well, I got to this Emerald Tablet. And it fascinated me because, and I don't know who wrote it. It supposedly came from some place under the pyramids or something by this guy who died. I mean, did he make it up? I don't know. Did he put stuff in there? His own stuff? Maybe. I don't know. I said, I don't know what to tell you to believe. But you know what? Regardless of who wrote it or what, it caused me to find a connection between this prehistoric culture from before there was an Egypt was the Kabbalah. A connection with that same UFO force and the classic Greek scientists like Democrates and Zeno, quantum physics, astronomy, anatomy, uh, universal construct all of this stuff. Because I always said, I said to Joan, how could these people be living in one neighborhood? They knew everything, and the rest of the world selling sheep and splitting rocks. It doesn't make any sense. Well, where'd they come from? Well, because of this study, we found that Pelestians came from the place of that UFO landing, came and migrated or flew the UFOs to this place called what they call now Greece, and, and that's where these guys came from. And it connected me to Krishna. I never knew that in the Hindu text there was UFOs. I never knew that they had sky battles and all this stuff. And then it connected me to Jesus. Because I never knew until I got into this study that Jesus' closest personal friend in the Bible was an alien who flew in a UFO. I said, well, wait a minute. If Jesus knew this guy flew in a UFO, 
How did he get here? Oh, they're sitting around in the Bible. He says, that's John the Baptist. You see that guy over there? Yeah, yeah. That's Elijah. I look and Elijah gets in a fiery chariot and takes off into the sky and disappears out of sight. That's a UFO. Hey, Jesus, if you knew him, you knew an alien in a UFO. And then it says at the end of the Jesus story, he was carried up into the sky. By what? And then we connected the pyramid. And you know what? We connected the whole thing to December 21st, 2012. How? Because some of those UFO forces from this before Egypt took off and landed in South America, which is now called the Mayans, 30,000 years ago. Don't you see a little strange? They said they built the pyramids and there were pyramids in Egypt and then all of a sudden there's pyramids in the Mayans. Where'd they come from? Then, this guy Pakal Votan, supposedly a Mayan, is the guy talking about 2012. And the Mayans carve a stone picture of this guy and he's sitting in a UFO. I'm going to show you a picture. So I'm saying, this is crazy. But you know what? I've gotten more emails and more interest in this. Why? Because we've connected everything. It all connects. I said, nobody's going to get mad at me because I said Jesus was an alien. You know why? Because they think aliens are little green men with pointed chins and big heads and big eyes, you know, and they're little. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible said the guys that got out of the UFOs were men. Just people. And if you look at the word alien, it means you come from another place. And then you look in the Bible and Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. I said, okay, pal, you're an alien. See? So all we start to do is use common sense. Look at science. Don't believe anything. Don't, don't sell your house because of this, but just connect pieces. <clears throat> I'm going to try to bring that tape of that little kid next year. But anyhow, I'm doing all this talk about UFOs. Which is something, as I said, I haven't done in the past. But I, yeah. And then here comes the headline, which I thought was curious. Take a look at this headline. The Vatican looks to the heavens for signs of alien life. What? Mm -hmm. They only have to look inside their places for signs of alien life. But anyhow, Vatican City, E.T. phone Rome, it says. 400 years after it locked up Galileo for challenging the view that the Earth was the center of the universe, the Vatican has called in experts to study the possibility of extraterrestrial alien life and its implication for the Catholic faith. You know what this is? They're not saying, do you think there's aliens out there? They're saying, maybe they're coming. Then if they do, how are we going to explain this? <laughs> The questions of life's origins and of whether life exists elsewhere in the universe are very suitable and deserve serious consideration. Reverend Gabriel, an astronomer and director of the Vatican Observatory, five-day conference gathered scientific to describe astrobiology, the study of origin of life and its existence elsewhere in the cosmos. You can look at that. You can look that up. But it is. It's not whether they exist. It's if they come. What are we going to say? You know? I wonder if Jesus gets out of a UFO. How do we explain this? <laughs> oh, my God. Now, this is the part. I was, then, I was laying on my couch with the cat. As Joan was sitting watching her 35th rerun of The Bold and the Beautiful, is it? <laughs> So I said, wake me up when Victor gets done uh, with his problems. And then anything, uh, an ad come on for this movie 2012. And, uh, you know, my eyes were popping because, I mean, let me, let me show you what kind of what it looked like. These were the pictures. I mean, buildings were falling down, cars were getting crushed, planes were flying in between buildings, the Empire State Building was floating out to sea. I mean... This whole thing 
was, you know, and I said, you know, this isn't what they said. Nobody ever said this. But now people have <coughs> grabbed it, and in order to make money off of it, it's become apocalyptic, you know. There's going to be, uh, everything's going to blow up to smithereens. I said, oh, I can't deal with it. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm considered nuts as it is. I don't want to be associated <laughs> with it. I don't want people saying, well, hey, look, you said that. I mean, I'd, oh, that must be Bill's movie. He must have, and I, no, I don't have, I don't want any part of that. And I'll tell you why this is so critical. What I have connected and am proposing and I've covered in these previous sessions, is that the prediction of 20, December 21, 2012 did not come from Mayans. You know, I often wondered about that. I mean, these people are in the middle of a jungle. They're, they sacrifice people. What do these people know about uh, this stuff? And they said, well, well, I find Paco Votan. I said, ah, maybe this guy's an astronomer. And all right, but I'm not going to credit the Mayans because that's, you know, no matter what you do, people go archaeology and they got pottery and they're sitting there drinking pots and all of this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> what is that? But Paco Votan, I said, hmm, he could be a really sophisticated astronomer. Even, but even him, he's in the jungle. Who, who taught him this stuff? But what I learned was that at the Emerald UFO landing base in Egypt, which is the land of Kemp, they land there. And then the commander says, I want you guys split up. You go in different directions around the Earth and start civilizing the Earth race. So a group of them takes off in a UFO, lands in South America. And then all of a sudden, pyramids start popping up there. And then we get this thing from this Paco Votan about December the 21st, 2012. I started taking 2012 much more seriously because it is obvious to me it wasn't the prediction of some ancient jungle race. It was the prediction of a very advanced scientific technological race from another place, another dimension. So with that, I said, you know, what the heck is, is going on here? Let me show you why I reached that conclusion about the Mayans in 2012. If you look at this, it says, some 1,300 years B.C., Egypt, the ancient Chem, was in turmoil. Many delegation of priests were sent to other parts of the world. Forget that word priest. You know I mean, people are writing a couple thousand years ago. You've got to keep one thing in mind. What you call aliens today, they called angels then. Okay? What you call aliens today, they called gods then. You go into a, you go into a middle of a jungle and take out a, a cell phone and start having, playing music or people talking. You, you, you're God. Your God. Among those were some of the pyramid priests who carried with them the emerald tablets. The particular group of priests bearing the tablets emigrated to South America where they found a flourishing race of the Mayas. Well, I disagree with that. I believe they were there long before the Mayas ever existed. Among these, the priests settled and remained. In the 10th century, the Mayas had thoroughly settled the Yucatan, and the tablets were placed beneath the altar of one of the great temples of the sun god. So, in other words, those who the emeralds say landed in UFOs took off and settled in South America, which became Maya country, and from out of there came this great cosmic prediction about 2012. So I think it's a much more advanced race and not some jungle-oriented uh, uh, primitive race. Now, Something else struck me. There appeared a carving from the Mayans of Pakal Votan, who is credited with making the December 21st, 2012 prediction. Now, you look at it. And what you're going to see, it looks like he's sitting in a UFO or a, a spaceship of some kind. And what I've done to try to give you an idea is I've put a picture of John Glenn, our famous astronaut, in his uh, space capsule training module. Take a look at them. There's Pachal Votan, maybe if you look sideways, and there he is m manipulating the controls. What the heck is that? You can see that today. There's John Glenn and his training module. 
Now, it doesn't prove anything. I know that. I'm not trying to prove anything. I say, isn't it a bit curious? I mean, maybe. Doesn't it look like two astronauts? And if, you know, you, you can go on, you, you want to go on, go on Google and Google Paco Votan and you'll see the picture yourself. That alone does not necessarily give credibility to the UFO story, but the Emerald Tablet saying that a UFO force took off and then landed in South America, and then the next thing you know, the Mayans are paying tribute to this ancient person who was there, and they picture him in what looks like a spaceship of some kind. Well, two and two, like four. So I, I show it to you. So let us entertain the possibility that it wasn't primitive tribes making pottery that predicted 2012, but somebody from another place, like this guy. I searched and I found a book. And um, I, I read the book. And, and what I wanted to do, I wanted to get away from all of the pundits who talk about 2012, and especially all of these media people and religious people who come on and say, oh, it's the end of the world and all of that stuff. And I found a book written by a shaman who is a master of the Mayans Elder Council. And I thought, well, at least, let me, let me try to go to the horse's mouth. I mean, nobody else. And I'll, give you, I'll show you a copy of the book if you're interested. You, you might be able to get it. The Book of Destiny, Unlocking the Secrets of the Ancient Minds and Prophecy of 2012. Carlos Barrio, shaman and member of the Mayan Elders Council. So, you know, I thought, well, I'll listen to this guy. And, and, and I thought, well, let's look at some of the points that he's made and then consider back the origin from the Emerald Tablet. Okay, let's look at what he says. First of all, there are things you never heard before. The true name of the 2012 prophecy is Ajab Nim Ahab. Okay, we never heard that before. It's the first time you're ever hearing that. The start of the transition period was from 1987 to 1992. What's being discussed here is nature. Everything is natural. There is no boogeyman. There is no God throwing lightning bolts. This is all nature. The prophecy draws attention to environmental damage wrought by humans. Okay? What Pakavotan said is what's going to happen is people are going to get so consumed with scientific advancements, they are going to forget their interdependence with nature. Now, how, how would somebody in a loincloth making pottery bowls know that? They wouldn't. But a guy who was part of this UFO, who knew of what goes on in different galaxies, could say, this is exactly what's going to happen. And so what has happened? People are waiting for 2012. Forget about waiting for it. You're in the middle of this global warming. And you look and you see the ice melting and the oceans are going up. You're in the middle of a factory farming and the scientists from the most prestigious places are saying you're going to have a, an epidemic, a plague in this place that you're not going to be able to cure. You saw t your two biggest examples of, of capitalism and industrialization dumped down to the ground at the World Trade Center in one hour. Wars and people dying for no reason at all. I mean, it's all kinds of crazy stuff. Sure, there's always been war. Sure, there's always been. But the point is, it has never been a time when these predictions were attached to it and never been a time when you living through, you've always heard about religious prophecies, but you're living through this. You know doggone well there's global warming. You know doggone well about fact reform. You want to talk about fact? You want to talk about a plague? You want to talk? Do you know there's a swine flu going on? And do you know that it says in this country it's touched 20 million people and I don't know how many thousands have died? And do you know that if you're under 18 years old, you're not allowed into a hospital to visit anybody? There's an epidemic here. And so, you know, you, you're living right through the thing, 
But if you go to a church, what will they? Will they tell you about it? No. They'll sing, this is the day that the Lord has made, and they'll jump up and down. But you're not there to hear that. The gestation period for this change was from 1992 to 2001 <coughs> when <coughs> political and socioeconomic transitions occurred. Oh, well, we didn't see anything different. The United States selects a black guy whose middle name is Hussein as the president? When could that ever be? Didn't some kind of magical thing have to happen for that to happen? Of course. That's a change. Here's a guy named Barack Hussein Obama. He's black. He gets elected president. And here's some aliens called God sitting up and saying, they still didn't get it. They haven't figured this out. You, are you going to go down here? You crazy? <laughs> the last time we went down here, they threw rocks at us. Now we're going, they're going to shoot missiles. I ain't going down here. But they, don't, they haven't figured this out. I, uh, what are you going to do? Barack Hussein. I made the guy president. And they fell on his... Okay. So it says, connected are wars, natural catastrophes, global warming, floods, and earth. Well, you know, so what? There's always been wars, there's always been catastrophes, global warming, floods, and earthquakes. But we're attaching it at a different time. You know, different things have happened. Like, you know, the election, the, the collapse of the economy, the capitalist, the great capitalist economy. You see in the United States, soon we'll be following China and all this stuff. And all of these things have happened, but now we're connecting them. December 20, well, 2012, Job Ajaw is the fifth son. First time in 26,000 years the sun will intersect with the Milky Way and plane of the ecliptic. That's significant. December the 21st, 2012, that's going to happen. There is nothing you have to believe. There is nothing you have to do. All you have to do is sit there and it's going to happen. And you'll be able to say, wow, this hasn't happened in 26,000 years and here I am. And it happened right on my head. That's pretty significant. The Mayan grandfathers called this a return to the beginning. In other words, the guy up in the heavens saying, we better start the whole damn thing over again. They, 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 they didn't get it yet. Start again, Charlie. Rub it up. And so, the return to the beginning. And that's what it's called. So, that last comment is interesting. Because it would seem as if what he refers to as the Mayan grandfathers are those from the Emerald UFO. Now, let's look at the next one. The events to occur are called the purification. Radical changes in environment plus epidemics. You are sitting in the middle of global warming, fatric farming, and all of this stuff, and you have an epidemic right now called the swine flu. They don't call it the swine flu. They call it the H1N1 flu because, God forbid, you stop eating pork chops. That's why they don't want to tell you what it really is. It didn't start in Mexico. It started in a pig farm in South Carolina. Somebody caught it because it is rampant in those places, and every night you sit down to dinner, you eat it. Purification ends in September 2010, following period to culminate December the 20th, 2012, called the definition. Now this is what the shaman from the Mayans said. This is not the end of the world, but the time of cleansing. Okay? So all of the stuff you're seeing on television is garbage. It's like everything else they do. It is to frighten people, to scare people, and to make money. They will get millions and billions of dollars by people going to see that movie. I am not concerned about a movie. But when I see the epidemics prophesied by this group, I think of the John Hopkins scientists, and I said, they got some pretty credible witnesses in their corner. Okay. Now, let's see the next one. The consumerism garbage of the minds will be cleared away, 
and replaced with a resurgence of true spirituality and respect for ourselves and others on the planet. Let me just give you an example of, of how, how totally cockeyed and screwed it. Just recently you had this guy, this Muslim major, shoot all of these people at this um, army base. And everybody says, it's terrorism, it's terrorism, it's terrorism. I mean, you know, tell me what happens here. Let's say the United States is a Muslim country, and a small minority are Christians. Okay? And you know, Christians can be pretty radical, pretty aggressive. This United States, the Muslim country, invades Italy. And they kill hundreds of thousands of Italian Christians who didn't do anything to anybody. Do you think there may be some Christians, born-again Christians in this Muslim army who might get ticked off and go nuts and take a shot at somebody? Of course. People, when they get consumed in religion, do this. People... I mean, Christians shoot abortion doctors because the religion tells them that's evil. This guy shot these Americans who were killing Muslims because he said they, his religion said it's evil. It's all of this kind of lunacy that develops through religion. You, can't, you, 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 you can go in and say, you know, God bless America, but you're just over there dropping bombs on, on 200,000 innocent people and blowing them to smithereens and they didn't do anything to anybody. You know what that is? That's terrorism. Oh, you went to Vietnam. You killed 3 million of them there. And you killed 56,000 Americans. And you know what you're doing now with the same people that you were fighting with? You're building hotels and spas and resorts in Vietnam. You can fly American Airlines over there. You can go to a nightclub run by Americans. And you can go right here in Tom's River to the Macy's and buy their clothes. And you know what? The three million Vietnamese and the 56,000 Americans, right as you're sitting here, are spinning in their graves. What, you know, what kind of criminal stuff was that? that you're now doing business. They have an article in the Time magazine how we could have won the war in Vietnam. I, I wrote them an email. I said, no, you, you did win. You did win. You got all your hotels and all your spas and all your nightclubs and all your stuff over there. And you got them making blouses to send over here and only had to pay them 30 cents an hour or whatever you pay them. So. And then you look at this stuff and it said, if you're going to misbehave, then you're going to have to pay out. But what will come is we will take advantage of our technology without allowing it to consume us or destroy nature. The time of Jabba Jawa, the fifth Sunday, December 21, 2012, is a period of time when humans ascend to a harmonious spiritual cycle. Masculine and feminine will be equally balanced. You know, I'm glad to see that because remember all the weddings I do, I always say the one condition, no man is going to submit to a woman, no woman's going to submit to a man. This is a partnership. So that's coming. <laughs> a little light to that. That's coming. So it's going to be a radical change. Now let's look at that. This will not change automatically. And that's a very interesting thing to consider. Those who fail to become aware, now take this very easily, and take action towards nature could disappear. They could disappear. They could die. If the Johns Hopkins people tell you you better be careful about what you're putting in your mouth and you continue to put it in your mouth, you may disappear. It's not my problem. I didn't tell you that. You can go on any internet, look up John Hopkins, look up virus, and they'll tell you. Somebody doesn't stop this, a lot of people are going to disappear. Humanity's destiny depends on our reaction to the events that we are experiencing now. Isn't that interesting? Our growing awareness, our seriousness, our ability to learn in the action we take. And everybody laughed at global warming. Why? Because its spokesman was Al Gore. And he's a Democrat. 
which means all the Republicans knew it had to be a lie. It is important that we foster a positive outlook toward the fifth son, and look at this one, and avoid creating a mass hysteria. What you are seeing and experiencing now <coughs> is what will increase and continue until the culmination of 2012, unless somebody stops it. Now, when I told you about the factory farming, <coughs> and you were talking about the different farms in, in, in Europe, there are farms, and, and Time Magazine calls this, there are some farms that are growing in the United States where chickens are running around again, and um, uh, cattle and so forth are out grazing in the pasture and, and living a normal life and are not stuck full of antibiotics. So some people are doing that, and that's a positive thing. That type of thing, if it gets mandated and if all of this stuff stops, then that can change that. So it is not as bad. You know, and maybe somehow, uh, I don't know if, it's, if there's time to stop the pollution that they're dumping into the atmosphere, but if there isn't, then that can change it too. So avoid mass hysteria, that's very, very important. But the media is doing the opposite of that. And I want to make it clear that from my position, that I went and, 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 and with this book from this Mayan shaman, I think the explanation is extremely good. It's not something coming out of the blue. You're experiencing it right now. You can feel it. You can sense the change. And it is just going to amplify unless we are prepared to make some changes and accommodate nature. And you say, you know, I'm not making up a lot of junk here because... NASA agrees. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration has said that between 2010 and 2012, there will be the most severe solar storms since records have been kept. Dr. Michio Kaku, who, Keiko, who is a uh, Japanese quantum physicist, said, you know what's the matter? People in industry have taken and totally forgot about nature and put the whole world on computers. So, if these things happen and they come the wrong way, these gamma flares can destroy the electronic grid on the Earth. Completely upset the electronic grid and change everything. What does that mean? You wouldn't be able to go to the store because everything is based on... You wouldn't be able to go to the hospital. You wouldn't have any television. You wouldn't have any telephone. You wouldn't have anything. See? Because we don't have any backups. We never, we, we forgot about nature. We forgot that nature's involved. We don't, you know? And when they talk about the electronic grid being changed, I want to tell you something. You know where the most significant electronic grid that involves you is? It's right on top of your shoulders. It's called your brain. And the computers are not just going to be touched. You're going to be touched as well. And that's where the change is going to come, where people are going to start saying, I don't think we should be doing this. Electronically, the brain's going to change, the frequency's going to change, the minds are going to change. So the warnings are coming our way. Let's wrap it up with this particular. The prophecies are clear. All the cycles come to an end with the arrival of December 21, 2012, the fifth sun, Jabba, Jaw, and a time of peace and understanding and harmony will come. It's up to all of us to ensure that the majority of humanity will be here when this happens. We are in desperate need of this change. This is our opportunity and our responsibility to elevate Mother Earth to a higher plane within the cosmic order. Our grandfathers are calling out to all humanity. Enough fighting to be the best. Put your pride aside. Stop looking for material gain and assume your role once and for all. How, you know, what is that? Is that something scary or is that something beautiful? It's something beautiful. Yes, it is. I think we have enough information from the Emerald Tablet to suggest that those we call the Mayans today were actually part of the Emerald Alien UFO Force, and that's where this came from. For those of you that are watching, um, you can go on our website, Hidden Meanings, www.hiddenmeanings.com, and I have the first three messages I gave on this <coughs> laid out in text. And you can study every word, you can study every overhead, and look and make a decision for yourself. 
yesterday, I mean, it wasn't yesterday, a couple of days ago, I was watching uh, scientists who were studying the Mayan pyramids using electrical equipment to measure, and they were measuring something they called torsion energy. And they were suggesting in their conversations back and forth that, hey, you know, these things were not made by people who didn't know what was going on. These things were made by an advanced race. Of course they were, and we know where the advanced race came from. How could people in the jungle be advanced to that extent, except they were actually people who had come here from another place, and that landing place in the land of Kemp. One last reference to the Book of Destiny concerning this, on, on, and it's on page 141. I want to show it to you. Honduras is believed to have contained an astronomical observatory. <coughs> it houses a stone engraved with mammoths, prehistoric animals. Disappeared 12 to 15,000 years ago. Western archaeologists, researchers, and historians find it hard to acknowledge that such a highly developed civilization existed over 3,500 years ago while Europeans were still living in caves. You see what I'm saying? How could that be? Okay, group, you take off from here, and I want you to go to point such and such, and they land there. And that's how come they know. So we looked one last time at this to see how this was all possible. And we find out that they were sent to other parts of the world. They came to South America, the Mayas, and that's where this all started. That's how come these people were so damn smart. The rest of them were still making pottery and drinking and shooting gazelles or whatever they do. So the Mayan force was not Mayan, but an alien emerald force. And that's why Pakal Votan is pictured in a spaceship. That's why they're so advanced. And that's why I am convinced that the prophecy of 2012 was not made by Mayans, but an advanced race. Once again, this is the book that I was taking this from. If you want to look at it, uh, you're interested in it. I don't have anything to do with it. I don't sell it, but I mean, uh, it's good to read because it, it, makes, it makes some common sense. Okay? The Book of Destiny, Unlocking the Secrets of the Ancient Mayans and the Prophecy of 2012 by Carlos Barrios, shaman and member of the Mayan Elders Council. The Book of Destiny. I don't know who the publisher were, was, is, or whatever. You know, we've looked at so many things. I, I came across something in the Emerald Tablet that I thought was, was interesting about concerning the integration with the people of the earth and, and who they are. You don't even know who I am. You have no clue. And I get people write me and say, who the hell do you think you are knowing all this stuff? <laughs> what is that? No. But look, look, look at this. <laughs> Far in a, this is from the Emerald Tablet. Far, uh, incidentally, you can find it at www.crystalinks.com. Far in a past time, lost in the space time, the children of light that's the aliens, looked down on the world, seeing the children of men in their bondage, bound by the force that came from beyond. They knew that only by freedom from bondage could man ever rise from the earth to the sun. In other words, group, it's time to lift off, head down here, and talk to these people and try to help them out. Down they descended and created bodies, taking the semblance of men as their own. In other words, they looked just like you. Look at the person sitting next to you. You never know. We are they who were formed from the space dust, partaking of life from the infinite all, living in the world as children of men, like and yet unlike the children of men. Look just like you, but don't think like you, don't act like you, and know some things you don't know. See what he's saying? In other words, you're speaking to someone who's telling you something and you think 
they're just like you, but really not. And you know what I've been doing through this whole exercise with the Emerald Tablets? I've been comparing everything to the Bible, like and yet unlike the children of men. Let's go to the Bible. Do not forget to entertain strangers. By doing that, some have entertained angels unaware. Just change that word to aliens unaware. You hear all this, we see. You see that nut down here? You hear that, what that nut saying? And the guy's in LA. Beam me up, Scotty. Hmm. So the Bible and the Emerald say the same thing. Some have entertained aliens unaware. I can guarantee you that. So what we're doing is accumulating information connecting the alien UFO force to the Bible, to Jesus, to classic Greek science, to the Mayans, to December 21st, 2012, and last week to India. Last week, we found the ancient Hindu Mahabharata, of which the Bhagavad Gita is part, which I talked about, and there were things which called the Manas, and they flew in space. And you know what? Based on the descriptions in the Mahabharata of what the uh, spaceships in the, of the Hindus' ancient times, and they were from this bunch here, what they look like, artists have been able to draw, you know, giving you a, a picture of, of what they think they look like. And this is an artist drawing from the Mahabharata of the Shakuna Vimana. And look at it. And they said it flew. But you know what's interesting? If you take that and put it next to one of NASA's ships. Let's do that. Look at that. You wonder where NASA got the design. <laughs> now we're going to look at the Rukma Vimana. This is another one whose description was in the Mahabharata. And you can see it. That's a vertical section. Now let's take a look at the American. What the heck is that all about? Here it is. Here it is. It's, it is curious, don't you think? I mean, this is a spaceship from 30,000 years ago in Hindu literature of Krishna that took off and flew, okay? This is a spaceship from last week. And it took off and flew. And not only that, you couldn't see this on TV, but you did see that on TV. But you know what? 30,000 years from now, there'll be people saying, this is a spaceship that they had back in 2009. And some guy will say, are you nuts? My pastor's going to get ticked off when he hears you saying that. They didn't have stuff like that back in those days, but you know they did. We do. You know what the book of Ecclesiastes says in the Bible? There is no new thing under the sun. Everything that has been is, and everything that is has been. There was another Vamana discussed in the Mahabharata, and, and I wanted to share it with you. A journey from Vedic India's Vamana. Flight in the Earth's atmosphere into space is thought to have originated in the 20th century. However, that may not be the case. In the Vedic literature of India, recording events that occurred 12,000 to 15,000 years ago, there are many descriptions of flying machines that are generally called Vimanas. And you just saw a couple of them. The Mahabharata speaks of two-storied celestial chariots with many windows. They roar off into the sky until they appear like comets. The Mahabharata and various Sanskrit books describe at length these chariots powered by winged lightning. It was a ship that soared into the air, flying to the solar and stellar regions. You know, it's like the leader of the Emerald UFO force, according to the Egyptians, was called Toth. The leader of the Emerald UFO force, according to the Greeks, was called Hermes. 
Then along came the Hellenists who wrote the Bible. And they called it Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus means thrice Hermes, three persons in one, the Son of God. They were the same people that wrote the story about Jesus, three persons in one, the Son of God. But then the Romans came along. And the Romans said, what are we going to call this guy? Oh, well, well, we heard, this is thousands of years ago, but we heard this guy flew around in space, in the sky, real fast. Got any ideas here, Bruno? Yeah, let's call him Mercury. Well, how are we going to depict these flying around here? What, what, what would that be? Well, we'll put wings on his hat and wings on his shoes. That's got it. And he flies up into the sky. The Emerald UFO guy is back now. He's called Mercury. And you know what? You had a picture of him on your dime. You remember? Yes, he was on your dime. Here is a drawing that scientists made based on the Mahabharata's discussion about this two-storied celestial chariot that rose up into... This is the way it was described in the Mahabharata. Take a look at this one. What do you think? You see? But something happened. Do you know what happened? Aliens are not little green men. Aliens are people. Just like you and me. And something went wrong, and they got into a fight. One group might have said, hey, look, you guys took off. You went to South America. It's the tropics. It's nice. I'm stuck over here in India. But you did this because you're sucking up to the head uh, UFO, and they're going to have a big fight. Then what happens? It is recorded that between 12 to 15,000 years ago, nations developing vamanas in space with lethal weapons were locked in a global war that destroyed almost all of human life and property on planet Earth. Do you see what this says? Because I often thought, if they had UFOs 30,000 years ago, how come we're only messing around with them now? Everything got wiped out. They had a battle. Somebody got carried away, they destroyed each other. Let's go to the sacred text of the Mahabharata of Krishna. Gurkha, flying a swift and powerful Vamana, hurled a single projectile charged with the power of the universe. An incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose with all its splendor. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death which reduced to ashes the entire race of the Vrishnis and the Anhakas. The corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. Hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without apparent cause. The birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. To escape from this fire, the soldiers threw themselves in streams to wash themselves and their equipment. It was a weapon so powerful that it could destroy the earth in an instant. A great soaring sound in smoke and flames and on it sits death. The Ramayana said that. And then the Mahabharata said dense arrows of flame like a great shower issued forth upon creation encompassing the enemy. A thick gloom swiftly settled upon the Pandava host. All points of the compass were lost. In the darkness, fierce wind began to blow. Showering dust and gravel, birds croaked madly. The very elements seemed disturbed. The earth shook, scorched by the terrible violent heat. Elephants burst into flame and ran to in a frenzy. Over a vast area, other animals crumpled to the ground and died. From all points of the compass, the arrows of flame rained continuously and fiercely. What else? You don't think this is... You lived. Yeah. You lived it. Do you think this sounds too much? Ask the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki if that wasn't a brilliant description of what happened. But that was thousands and thousands of years ago. I want to go back just for a minute and 
change for a second and discuss the Emerald Tablet to what we previously discussed concerning the Great Pyramid at Giza. The UFO commander known as Toth said, I created the pyramid. With that in mind, uh, let us look at text from part two of the Emerald Tablet. Look with me. Emerald Tablet part two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, each with his mission, each with his powers, guiding, directing the destiny of man. There they sit. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I built the great pyramid, pattern after the pyramid of earth force, burning eternally so that it would remain through the ages. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I built the pyramid. Toth was called the god of eight, who reported to the eight commanders of the eight deities from Hermopolis, which was the city of eight. Eight, eight, eight. Incidentally, Jesus, whose friend flew in a UFO named Elijah, was created by the Hellenists, and the name Jesus was selected because in Greek it has the number 888. And so the pyramids were built, and we all thought they had four sides, because they do. One, two, three, four. Oh, no, they don't. Look. What we found was the pyramids are concave, and they have eight sides. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The god of eight from the city of eight, reporting to the eight deities, created the pyramid of eight. Coincidence, John. I built the great pyramid. Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. That was discovered in 1940 by a pilot by the name of Grove, a Navy pilot who flew over and reported back, hey, you know something? There's eight sections to that thing. And you know what? If you go on the ground to look at it, you can't see that. And you know what? When you go on the internet website, you'll read all about it, and you'll read about the scientific thing, and they wind up saying, we have no logical reason to explain the eight parts. They don't know, but you know. <sighs> the words flow from the tablets to the ages of time. You know what I wanted to do, and we'll wrap up with this, uh, I was looking at the Emerald Tablet and, and from a different thing of not rushing to compare it to the Bible or to all these different things and the pyramids and all the stuff, although that's fun and that's interesting. But you know what I found was that in going to part three and part four, and that's all we're up, there's 16 parts and we're only up to part, I just completed part four. But this is just it will take us a few minutes. But I thought there's something very beautiful in what was said 30,000 years ago by a group from another galaxy who landed in a UFO. Look what they said. Do not cause fear, for fear is a bondage, a fetter that binds the darkness to men. They that are guided do not go astray, but they that are lost cannot find a straight path. If you go among men, make love. Make it the beginning and the end of the heart. If one comes to you for counsel, let them speak freely, so you may help him for the purpose that he has come. If he hesitates to open his heart to you, it's because you are wrong. In other words, he wasn't comfortable with you. Not to preach fear. You know what I think of when I saw that? I think of Franklin Roosevelt many years ago, the president saying, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. The second paragraph amplifies Jesus. They that are lost cannot find a straight path. And I remember Jesus saying, the blind leading the blind, and when that happens, they both fall in a ditch. And the third I'm familiar with, because I have watched young council people for many, many years, Although, I, 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 I'll be honest with you, she's been counseling people for, we've been married 51 years, she's been counseling them for 55 years, I don't know. 
But I, I never sat in on one of them, but I, I noticed something about her that she is totally consumed in that because she sits there and listens to everything. And she listens and she listens and she listens and, and these people speak and speak and speak. That's a skill that I lack because as soon as you start talking to me, I start shouting back, ah, you're full of crap. And that last line is, anybody's afraid to speak to you. It's not because of their lack of confidence, but it's rather a lack of confidence in you. And so I went to, to part four, and there's just a couple more. And <clears throat> Silence is of great profit. An abundance of speech profits nothing. Do not exalt yourself above the children. See, these are instructions being given at you know meetings when these guys landed from the commander. You can imagine him in a classroom out in the desert somewhere, and he's telling them, hey, don't go around acting like a big shot with people, you know? And, and just keep your mouth shut on some of this stuff and listen to people. If you wish to, to be great among men, then have them look to you for knowledge and gentleness. And if you, if you wish to know the nature of a friend, don't ask his companion. Spend some time alone with him. You know? It says, test his heart by his words. And there are mysteries in the cosmos that when unveiled fill the world with their light. I, I thought... You know, I said, gee whiz, this seems like a training session. And the point is, don't go lording yourself over other people because of what you know. Remember what Jesus said in the same thing, didn't he? He said, if you want to be the leader, be the servant. A couple of really strong points in number two, the word gentleness. See the word gentleness there? People will look to you for your wisdom, but because you're not overbearing and you're not rough with them. And the third admonishes us, try to understand people by what they say. And don't, don't be running around and spying on them and trying to figure them out. Sit and talk with them. And then we go into this, this one. It says, He who knows the fire that is within himself shall ascend to the eternal fire and dwell in it eternally. See, in, in, the, in the scriptures, they call it the baptism of fire or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. Man is a star bound to a body. Until the end, he's freed through his strife. But only by struggle and working hard shall the star within you bloom out in new life. All through the ages, the light has been hidden. Awake and be wise. <laughs> That, that, in part for that, that's beautiful. The baptism of fire. And, and of course, the fire within himself. And what did Jesus preach? The kingdom is within you. Man is a star. You see what it says there? That's not just a symbol. Do you remember Carl Sagan, who was an a astronomer and had TV shows and everything? He died. But there's a, something on the internet you can find. If you go, it's called the Symphony of Science. And the late Carl Sagan says, the universe is actually within us because we are made of star stuff. And notice how the emphasis is on hard work. And that means, you know, it's a struggle. So many people, when they say to you, I have such a hard time with meditation in my head and everything. And that's what it says. That's what he's telling you. This guy's saying this 30,000 years ago. It's hard. But you've got to do it. You gotta wanna do it. Oh, I'm the first one to say, oh, it's Tuesday night and the Mets are playing. I don't wanna get out of here. But I go. You know, and that's so wonderful because if I if I didn't have to come here Tuesday night for meditation, I probably wouldn't. It's too easy to lay on the couch and watch Victor and the Bold and the Beautiful. The last sentence is, says, awake and be wise. And the Bible says, let me, let me quote your scripture from the Bible. See this? Awake and be wise. what the Bible says. As for me, I will behold your face. I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. It says, when you go, it shall lead you. When you sleep, it shall keep you. And when you awake, it shall talk with you. It's pretty neat. This is the last one, and this will wrap us up tonight, but I'll share this with you too. It's beautiful. I found 
And this is the UFO guy. That man is living in darkness. That the great light of the great fire is hidden within. Take as part of your being the seven who are, but are not as they seem. I have opened my wisdom to you. Follow the path in the way I have led. Be masters of wisdom, son of the morning, light in life to the children of men. And now you can just say, okay, everybody get up and go out and do your job. That's the summation of, that ends part, it ended part four of, of the Emerald Tablet. And it emphasizes the inner light and, reserve, and refers to the seven. You want to call them the seven chakras of the Hindus or the seven seals of, of, of Revelation? Forget it if you want to, but make it a part of your being. And the conclusion is to be a light of life to people. And, and, and Jesus said the same thing, see? He said, be masters of wisdom and, 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 and light. Show the light. Jesus said, you know, people don't take a light and, and hide it. They put it up at the highest point of the building. And, and that is exactly the same thing that was said by this emerald UFO force. And so I don't in any way minimize Jesus when I say he was the alien because I honestly believe after all of this that he was the supreme commander of the UFO force who 30,000 years ago set in motion the true life and light of the universe and what human beings must follow in order to raise themselves amongst all of the things that hold us in bondage to the systems of the world. And we wrote about him, and we call his name what it is. But there are those who have come and have taken this message and this truth hostage for their own gain. That then places a responsibility within yourself to find within you that fire, that light, and then let it shine. We'll see you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.